Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday, Living Water family. Let us come together, especially on this day, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin with this call to worship from Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we celebrate you. We thank you. We worship you for the glory of the resurrection. We cannot state enough how central, how powerful this truth is. Truly, it changed the course of history. And so we want to acknowledge today especially that you are God. Jesus, you rose again and showed through the power of your re resurrection that you are trustworthy and true, that you are the truth, that you are the way, that you are the life. So we worship you today. We thank you. And as we worship together, as we hear from your word, oh God, I pray for a special blessing upon every single person watching this video today, upon every church as they gather all over the world. Oh God, will you bless us in a special way as we remember you today. We wait on you, we thank you, and pray all this in the name of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we are blessed once again today to be able to worship together. And today, the Kim family will be leading us in worship. And it's literally the entire Kim family. So we thank Deacon Sam, as well as Helen and Noel and Elise for leading us in worship. So let's go ahead and worship along with them together today.
Thank you to the Kim family for leading us in worship. Let's go ahead and go into God's Word right now. And if you have your Bible in front of you, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. The title of the message for today is, He Has Risen Just As He Said. What a time to be celebrating Easter and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This past Friday, as we were on Zoom together and remembering the death of our Lord Jesus, some of us spent some time in prayer after that service, and we were able to share honestly about the things that we're all struggling with these days. I'm truly so thankful to be part of this body of Christ and to have that blessing to be in this journey together. I'm really thankful for that because we really carry each other through our prayers and through our words of encouragement. And on a personal note, uh, the past couple of days uh, physically have been very difficult for me. So I appreciate the love and support all the more that I've been receiving from you during this time. It's a great time to be part of the body of Christ, to be part of the church. And it makes this day of celebration for the resurrection even more timely and powerful for us all. That said, a lot of us shared this past Friday about how fear is gripping us in so many ways. Fears about our own health, fears about our finances, fears about what life will look like once we eventually do get to the other side of this coronavirus. Fears about the future, what the world will look like, for our children and for the generations to come, and so many other fears as well. And that said, one of the reasons why celebrating the resurrection at this particular time is is so timely, it's because fear is also the primary emotion 
that is woven into the resurrection story. So let's go ahead and read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, and see how this passage speaks into the issue of fear and why the resurrection is still our greatest hope, not only to conquer our fears right now, but to conquer every fear for all eternity. Here's what God's Word says. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. What a powerful passage. What a powerful story. As we just read, it was at the crack of dawn on Sunday morning. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, as scripture says, who we believe to be Jesus' aunt, uh, the wife of Clopas, who was the brother of Joseph, Jesus' father, they came to the tomb. And Luke's gospel tells us that they came with spices to further embalm the body of Jesus. So it stands to reason that they did not come expecting him to have risen. They came expecting to see his body in the grave, in the tomb. Also, the reason why they came on Sunday morning and not on, not on Saturday was because Saturday was the Sabbath and it was unlawful to travel that distance on the Sabbath. So they came first thing on Sunday to pay their respects to Jesus. But what they found instead would forever change the course of human history. An angel of the Lord appeared, rolled back the stone covering the tomb, and sat on top of it. As a bit of heaven touched earth, a violent earthquake broke out. And the vision of the angel caused the burly Roman soldiers to literally faint like dead men. Then the angel declared that Jesus had risen from the dead and invited the women into the tomb to see that for themselves. With this mixture of joy and trembling fear, the women after hurried to tell the disciples that Jesus had risen. But along the way, they met someone. They met none other than the resurrected Jesus himself. And he greeted them. He greeted them, as verse 9 says. And that word in the Greek, by the way, for greeted means to rejoice. It's the word Cairo, rejoice. There is no better word to mark the first meeting between sinners and the risen Savior, than to rejoice, than to rejoice. And in their natural reaction, in their utter amazement of what they were witnessing with their own eyes, was to fall at his feet, to cling to his feet, and to worship him. Talk about worship in its purest form. And it moves my heart just to think about what that time of worship must have looked like. What that time of worship must have felt like. What it meant to them in that moment. My heart was honestly moved to tears, brothers and sisters, as I was typing this out. As I was thinking about that. Man, what that must have been like. The worship that we give to the Lord is often so empty. 
so distracted, so half-hearted, so imperfect in so many ways. Especially as a worship leader myself for so many years, it breaks my heart to think of the many times I worshiped the Lord in that same way myself. How gracious God is, that being said, that He still receives our worship, that He redeems our worship, that it is still pleasing to Him, that He still delights in our praises. God is so gracious. But on that day, those women realized with absolute certainty that Jesus was truly the Messiah. And so they worshipped Him with, with just this pure, sincere adoration and awe. Because the hope of all of Israel, since the beginning of time, really, since the beginning of God's promise to Abraham, and so many generations before them, was standing right before their eyes. God was standing right before their eyes. The man they had followed and loved was actually God himself, who had fellowshiped with them and loved them. And he had risen again. That moment changed them forever. What was the primary emotion the women who visited Jesus were feeling that day? It was fear. Fear. Can you imagine being one of those women? Even if Jesus had told them that he would rise again, which he did, but to actually see Jesus alive again must have filled them with an ambivalence of awe and terror, of joy and fear. Though the source of their fear is very different from the sources of our fears right now, it cannot be underestimated that the primary emotion to which the resurrection addressed first is that of fear. In verse 5, the angel told the women who came to Jesus' tomb, do not be afraid. And again in verse 10, Jesus also comforted the women with those same four words, do not be afraid. Twice in this relatively short passage, twice in the wake of the resurrection, the scripture cries out to a world full of so many fears and to a church that also is facing so many fears right now, do not be afraid. You know, if you just glanced, did a search through the entire Bible, the same phrase, do not be afraid, occurs over 80 times, at least in the NIV translation. For example, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, when God made his covenant with Abraham, God told him, do not be afraid, because God was his shield, his very great reward. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 3, God told Israel, or Jacob, to not be afraid to go to Egypt because God would make him a great nation there. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1, and in so many other passages in the Old Testament, God told the Israelites, do not be afraid when they face armies so much greater, more numerous, mightier than their own. Because God was with them, that he would be with him, and that he would fight for them. In Joshua 1, God repeatedly told Joshua, do not be afraid in having to follow in Moses' footsteps and lead the people into the promised land. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 17, Jonathan told his closest friend, and future king, David, do not be afraid because David would become king one day and that Jonathan's own father, the king at the time, King Saul, would not be able to lay a hand on him. In Jeremiah 46, God told the people of Israel, do not be afraid because he would eventually deliver them from exile into peace and security once again. Going into the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, the angel, of course, told Joseph in his dream, do not 
be afraid to take Mary home as his wife because the child within her womb was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And as we all know, when that child grew up and eventually emerged into the scene of first century Palestine when he was about 30 years of age and showed us all the way to the Father, he ultimately gave his life on the cross. But early on that Sunday morning, just as we read, he rose again and he delivered a message to the women who came to the tomb. That same message that he's declaring over us in the year 2020. In a world full of fear, that message is, do not be afraid. Listen to the words of our Heavenly Father as spoken through the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 41 verses 9 through 10. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. The resurrection is the source of our hope for today, for the rest of our days on earth, for the generations to come. The hope that Jesus has truly overcome the world and that every sin, every fear, even death itself has been swallowed up in victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have nothing to fear because he has risen. And not only has he risen, but as the angel declared in Matthew 28, verse 6, he has risen just as he said. So the first four words that really stand out to us are, do not be afraid. Here's another set of four important words, just as he said. Those four words right there can be easily read over without a, a second thought. But those four words mean everything to this passage, to the ins entire story of the Bible, and to the reality of our salvation. Now, twice in the Gospel of Matthew, Scripture records Jesus speaking of his future resurrection. First to the Pharisees in chapter 12, and then to his disciples in chapter 16. In Matthew 12, verse 40, the Pharisees were asking Jesus to do a miracle, to show them a sign, to prove that he was the Messiah. And in his rebuking response to them, he said that the only sign he would show them was the sign of Jonah, who was three days and nights in the belly of that sea creature. And likewise, Jesus would be before his resurrection. And then on, in Matthew 16, verse 21, Scripture tells us that toward the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus started to tell the disciples more and more about his coming, suffering, and resurrection. So when Jesus rose again on that third day, just as he said he would, it was the most improbable, the most impossible, and therefore the most significant act in all of human history. It was literally the greatest I told you so moment the world has ever seen. What God was saying then and is saying now is that if he could go as far as actually rising again from the dead in precisely the way that he had foretold that he would, that means that he will be faithful to everything else he has promised as well. That is why Apostle Paul declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that their message, the message of the gospel, is not a halfway good message. In other words, the gospel is not a yes and no message where God's promises are only reliable sometimes. You know, we often answer questions that way, right? When someone asks us something, we say, well, it's kind of yes and no. 
Well, that's not the gospel. The gospel is always yes and amen in Christ. God's promises are 100% reliable. The gospel is 100% the truth. It is 100% real and trustworthy. That's why Apostle Paul wrote in verse 20, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. That is so good. That means that when God promises us anything, because Jesus rose again, we know that those promises are sealed and they are yes in Christ. When God promises us that there is nothing to fear because He will fight our battles, the resurrection has sealed that promise forever. And we can say a resounding amen to the glory of God. When God promises us that He will provide all of our needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The resurrection has sealed that promise forever, and we declare amen to the glory of God. When God promises that His presence will always be with us, that He will never leave us or forsake us, that we will never be alone, that His Holy Spirit is indwelling us, we can say amen because Jesus rose again just as he said when God promises that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future as uncertain as that future may be right now neither height nor depth nor all anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God we can and we will declare amen unto the glory of God. Why? Because he rose again, just as he said. The resurrection is the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our hope, the foundation of the gospel. It is the single most important and powerful reality that we can affirm. So can we cling to the feet of Jesus, just as those women did early on that Sunday morning, and worship Him today. Worship Him. Can you lay down every single one of your fears and declare His promises straight from the pages of Scripture over your life, over your family, over our church, over the uncertainty of the future, over our nation, over the world right now? Can you ask the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to awaken you to a greater conviction of His truth today and to give you the assurance you need to live with greater joy and confidence in this season? Let us come before God in prayer right now to simply thank Him and praise Him for the glory of the resurrection. Let's go ahead and pray together as we close. And then I want to invite you to spend a moment right now in prayer as well for those things that we, I just talked about. This is a day of celebration. It's a day of declaration. It's a day of that resounding amen over all of the promises of God. So do that today. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we do worship you for the glory and the wonder of the resurrection. And we thank you, Lord, that because of the resurrection, we know that our fears are conquered for all of eternity. We thank you that because of the resurrection, we can live with confidence and joy. We thank you that because of the resurrection, our faith is not futile. Our faith is real. Our faith is stands upon the promises of God, which have been sealed by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We thank you. We give you glory today. In your mighty name we pray. Amen.